I'd now like to invite up uh, to the stage uh, Dr. Chris McCabe, who is the session chair, as well as the plenary panelists in order to uh, take their places in the comfy chairs and get us started with our discussion uh, for the first plenary, uh, decision-oriented evidence, uncertainties and opportunities. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Um, well, follow that. What a, what, what a standard's been set there. Uh, so th thank you very much. Uh, one of our speakers has uh, just uh, nipped out to w use the, the washroom. So uh, I, I, I'm going to share a conversation uh, I had yesterday evening at the uh, reception just to fill in a couple of minutes. A bit of a challenge to everybody. Um, HTA as Battle of the Bands. Okay. So my proposal was it's, uh, it's Bruce Springsteen's Cover Me versus the Rolling Stones, you can't always get what you want. <laughs> so if you have any alternatives, uh, I want to tweet them to the, uh, the hashtag HGAI Vancouver uh, 2018. We'll, we'll see, uh, see which best ones come up with. But, uh, so we're just um, waiting for, for Jeremy to join us. Uh, so whilst we wait for Jeremy, I will introduce uh, my, my two uh, colleagues. Uh, we've got uh, John Brassy, who uh, is from the UK uh, and works on uh, with the Trip Database Company uh, and has some really interesting things to say about uh, uh, the way we can use those sorts of data infrastructure uh, to support decision making. Uh, and we have uh, Professor Rachel Sachs from uh, uh, University of uh, Washington, Washington University. Uh, Rachel's uh, a legal scholar, uh, and I always, uh, I always love hearing how lawyers think about uncertainty and decision making because they come from such a different place. They've got these things called rights. It's, it's scary because I think in terms of opportunity cost, Rights and opportunity cost are kind of like two very conflicting paradigms, and, and I'm, I, I just can't wait to hear what uh, Rachel has to say, because uh, I'm hoping that uh, she's got a solution to that conundrum, that uh, 27 years of thinking about this thing I certainly don't have. Um, I, I'm, I'm sad to say that you will hear from me as well. Uh, most of you have heard what I have to say many times before, but, uh, but I'll go again. Uh, talking about opportunity cost and, and decision making um, uh, and I'll, sadly I will mention the dreaded phrase of value of information so for the geeks in the audience we, 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 we have a little bit of uh, expected value of uh, parameter information going on and of course the necessary uh, only in research versus only with research um, but for once it's not going to be all theoretical there's no algebra uh, we're going to talk about a real demonstration of the cost of not thinking about research that you could do instead of making a reimbursement decision. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. And I'm filling time desperately hoping that Jeremy, uh, so Jeremy's a senior researcher and director of the Oxford Empathy Program at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's a, uh, a, a Canadian, I believe. Uh, grew up in... I'm so surprised because I can't imagine why anyone who was born in Canada would leave Canada. Did I do good there? Did I go, do good? Thank you very much. And perfect timing, Jeremy. Come and take your seat. I had run out of even passively interesting things to say. Any moment I was going to give my presentation, and that's, you know, I, I, I want to say that. So, um, three fantastic speakers. I have seen their slides. It's, it's going to be great. And me. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> first up uh, is John. Uh, I'll hand over to you. Get out of the way. Thank you. Oh, this is where I get my clicker anxiety. Uh, it's really great to be here. Thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me. 
I was given the, the uh, they wanted me to be controversial, so I really hope I don't let them down on that point. Uh, the title of my talk is Perfect is the Enemy of Good, which is a Voltaire quote, and hopefully the reason behind that will become apparent through my talk. This is where I get the clicker all wrong. There you go. Yay, brilliant. The big green arrow. Shouldn't be that hard, really, should it? Uh, anyway, as mentioned, I, run, I created and run the TRIP database. I've been doing it for 20 years now. Uh, I created it as a result of some work I was doing in the National Health Service in the UK. I was tasked with supporting general practitioners to be more evidence-based, or 20 years ago it was to be more clinically effective. And I went to speak to them and they said, oh, we really don't want to be taught search skills, we don't want to be taught critical appraisal skills, we haven't got the time, just answer our questions. And so I went away being untrained, in searching and tr moderately trained in evidence-based medicine and I went and started answering clinical questions for GPs. It was an interesting experience uh, and I got moderately good at it and it became a, a whole, well, England and Wales adopted it as a, as, a, as a service for a number of years, but essentially it was, you had clinicians, you had general practitioners who had a knowledge gap, they had an uncertainty and they wanted real evidence to use in their patients with their patients. And the TRIP database was created to help me uh, find the evidence that was required and it's grown ever since, but the ethos is still there. How can we connect uh, clinicians, policy makers with evidence that can support their, their practice and their care? And it was during this time where my scepticism of systematic reviews uh, and systematic methods arose because I wanted an easy life answering questions for GPs and there frankly wasn't enough systematic reviews to answer the questions that we were receiving from GPs. I remember to this day going to see Ian Chalmers, who many of you will know, saying, I like Cochrane when Cochrane answers 5% of the clinical questions that we receive in our service. I would lower it now to 1%. It doesn't even come close. And that got me frustrated. There weren't enough systematic reviews for me to do my day job, so I had to do some hard work. And I soon realized there is a relationship between the resource put, well, I feel there was a relationship between the resource put into an evidence synthesis and the confidence of an accuracy of the answer or even the, the, the sort of certainty of the answer. And it's certainly not like this graph. This is a wrong graph because it's not as though you put twice as much effort into your evidence synthesis and get twice as good a result. It doesn't work like that. And, and it just got me pondering about where does this lead us? I wanted to answer questions for GPs, I wanted to do it well, uh, but I couldn't do a systematic review. I could spend up to, say, 12 hours doing a, 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 what I'd now call a rapid review, and am I doing a good thing? Am I being harmful by giving them answers that weren't systematic review standard? And I got over that particular mental hurdle by saying, well, at least it's going to be better than the GP doing it on their own. And so the bar was quite low. But the relationship was is a complex one. And I've lost, over the course of my 20 odd years now in EBM, I've done a lot of work around rapid versus systematic reviews. I know it's, rapid reviews are very popular at the moment. Uh, within TRIP, we've done a couple of studies, informal, not written up, which is probably a bit shameful. Uh, I'm not a very good writer. Uh, first method we used, we took a lot of Cochrane systematic reviews, we transformed them into a clinical question and we gave them to one of my trained staff, an information person, who could just use randomized control trials. We gave her four hours to do them, and in 85% of the cases, she came up with the same answer. I'm very interested in automation, and we did a semi-automated study, follow-up study, where we took 10 minutes to answer the questions. And again, it came up with 85% agreement. There's something magical I felt about 85%. More studies are coming out now, looking published studies, so formal studies which compare uh, rapid versus systematic, and most of the time there's no difference. And I think that's really interesting. <laughs> Should there be? You'd think there would be, but there isn't, generally. And I'm part of a study with, uh, being led by uh, Ian Marshall. Uh, it's a simulation study looking at about 12,000 Cochrane systematic reviews and looking at the effects of various rapid review shortcuts on the results. And the best method, 75% of the 
results were no change, and 7.7% of the time the changes were small to moderate. So again, we're getting 80, 85%. You can get the answer really quite quickly. And this graph is more accurate, but I still actually think it's wrong because you don't have enough data to make it right. But I think you can get to the right answer really quite quickly. And then you spend an awful lot of time and an awful lot of res resource trying to polish it, trying to make it make the answer, you be more confident in the answer. And it's a classic case of law of diminishing returns. And I sometimes, you know, I, I work and my, my passion is still in answering clinical questions for GPs. They can't wait around for months for answers. They need answers quickly. And I think sometimes in, in the evidence synthesis world, it's a bit navel gazing. It's a bit, oh, I've searched more databases than you. My search is more sensitive than you. And lose, losing sight of actually what's important here, which is getting a robust answer uh, to policymakers, decision makers, as quickly as possible. Because again, if we spend all our time doing uh, one study really, really, really well, you know, that means we are less able to do other studies and other reviews. But ultimately, I think it's a straw man argument. Uh, we often, in the rapid review world, we compare our results to systematic reviews. And I think that's a real problem because it bestows upon systematic reviews an agency they don't deserve. A few examples of, to back that up, most of you will be familiar with the All Trials, led by Ben Goldacre. About 50% of all trials aren't published. Yet we know most systematic reviews only look at published studies. Richard Smith, many years ago, 2008 I think it was, in PLOS One, wrote medical, he was a former editor of the BMJ. He's sort of fairly well positioned. He said medical journals are an extension of the marketing arm of pharmaceutical companies. And then more recently, uh, Ian Chalmers, Paul Glasgow, reviewers trying to summarise all the research addressing a particular question are limited by access only to a biased subsample of what, been, of what has been done. These are quite profound, and yet they're not, we don't discuss it much. And I think it's because we're in too much of a safe space. But the impact can be quite profound of all this reporting bias. Are people familiar with Eric Turner's paper? It's a brilliant paper. Eric used to work for the FDA and he looked, explored the uh, selected publication of antidepressant trials. And he worked for the FDA and he knew there was between 70 or 80 trials for antidepressants registered with the FDA. And he knew that about half were positive in favour of antidepressants and the other half were either uh, negative or ambivalent. And what he found was that all the positive studies, or the vast majority of the positive studies were published, and the vast majority of negative studies were not published. You do an evidence synthesis of the published studies, you get an answer, but in this case it exaggerated the effect by 33%, massively in favour of antidepressants. It's a really wonderful paper, and I really recommend anyone who hasn't read, read it to read it. But he's not in isolation. Uh, Beth Hart wrote in the BMJ doing a very similar analysis across more study areas. Uh, looked, I think it was just under 50 uh, meta-analyses and compared published versus unpublished meta-analyses. And again, in 50% of the cases, the effect size was out by greater than 10% by just relying on published journal articles. And the one I like, like most is the Tamiflu one led by Tom Jefferson. I'm biased because I know Tom. Uh, and I've spoken to him at length about it. But essentially, he used the first uh, Tamiflu systematic review for Cochrane. He did. He uh, relied on published journal articles. He got asked a few awkward questions, like how do you believe the journal articles? And basically, it got him thinking, actually, there's a good, there's a good point here. Can we rely on journal articles? And so he ripped up, ripped up the uh, Cochrane methodology handbook and effectively stopped using journal articles and will not use journal, journal articles to this day. Uh, he uses something called clinical study reports. Clinical study reports are horrible documents. They're typically thousands of pages long. They're unstructured. But they're much greater, they have much greater information about how the trial was uh, generated and carried out. But yeah, after his super-duper... Systematic Review Plus, as I call it. I don't think that will catch on. Uh, we're using the clinical study reports, uh, using lots of uh, freedom of information requests. He came up and found that Tamiflu, I'm probably going to get sued for this, but probably wasn't a great deal better than uh, paracetamol. And yet, 
In the UK, where I'm from, we spent £500 million stockpiling the drug. And that was probably because we based a lot of our studies on published journal articles, which were probably funded by the pharma companies. And Tom uses the iceberg metaphor. Uh, when you do a systematic review, you get the stuff that's available and that's published, which is the stuff above the waterline. But the vast majority of information is actually hidden. It never makes it to systematic reviews, never gets uh, found uh, for other sorts of evidence synthesis. And then on the right-hand side, there is, uh, it's my go at saying, well, this is a rapid review. You miss a bit of the stuff from the top, but you still miss all the stuff from the bottom. And really, in the totality of the evidence, uh, you're missing a relatively small portion because you've missed an already huge part of the portion already by, sand, by relying on published journal articles. And for me, it's <laughs> the, the, the really important question here is, do we need all the data or don't we? And the answer is, I hope for everyone's sanity and the lack of resources, we don't need all the data because we, we do one a year or one every century. I don't know. There's so much data out there, we can't possibly use it. And so if we accept the, the, the notion that we can't use all the data, how do we then decide what a sample site, what's a suitable sample for us to base our decisions on? What is good enough? And what delivers the most value? And I don't think we are close to answering any of those questions. I've, you know, I've been working in this field for 20 years, and I just don't. These are really fundamental issues, and it, you know, it concerns me that we're not answering asking these really important questions. And I think there's, I do think getting all the published journal articles is convenient. I know people who's in, who've actually done uh, reviews like I have will not, say, will, will not agree that it's convenient, but it's relatively convenient to get published journal articles that is to do freedom of information requests and go through clinical study reports. But it's completely arbitrary. You've got all the data, so you've got all the iceberg, and we somehow have arrived at this notion of, oh, let's just get the journal articles. Says who? Where's the evidence that that is the right thing to do? There isn't any. It's been done on habit. And it probably stemmed from 20 years ago, when we didn't know as much about reporting bias as we do now. And it's a habit, and a lot of people are very comfortable uh, relying on just using published journal articles. But we miss all the data, we've got to acknowledge that. And even if we did use all the published journal articles, all the published data, we do not remove uncertainty. There's no such thing as perfect information. All decisions will have an uncertainty associated with it. Yeah, oh, a mutual love of value of information. But, but <laughs> and that's the thing, it's a trade-off here between how much uncertainty we're prepared to put up with versus the, the cost of doing it. I actually think those that are involved in the setting the standards of evidence synthesis are conflicted. I think it's, uh, I'm conflicted because I'm, I'm passionate about rapid reviews, you know, so I'm, I'm really batting for, for those. But I think it's always problematic with those setting the standards are also the ones producing the goods. And I think that's an overlooked issue. And I do think if we want the right answer, we can get it really, really quickly, and we can get a pretty good estimate of the effect size of interventions really quickly. But if we really, really, really need an accurate answer, a systematic review won't do it. I often see systematic reviews as being caught between two stools. They're not quick enough, and they're not rigorous enough. And the thing that I, I want is that we develop an evidence-based for evidence synthesis, because we haven't got it. We're, I fell out with someone recently who sent me a paper to review, and she had written, oh, we need to search PubMed, and we need to search two other databases. I said, where's the evidence? <laughs> we, we know after 20 years, there's been papers going back 10, 20 years. How many databases do we need to search? Do we need to include English language studies? We still haven't got the answer. We still don't know. So I, I, I hope an evidence-based for evidence synthesis will uh, be forthcoming. And the Voltaire quote, perfect is the enemy of the good. Perfect is now in, in quotation marks uh, because we've got no such thing as perfection. 
And I think it's harmful when we, when we put upon a pedestal the systematic review and claim that's the gold standard, that's perfection. Uh, and I think that's detrimental because it stops us liberating ourselves and, and allowing ourselves to explore more rap rapid methods and to do more health technology assessments and systematic reviews. Thank you. Okay, it's only been 27 years, 30 years, that lots of us have been doing the wrong thing. Um, all good. Passing, uh, there's no such thing as value of perfect information. Yeah, I, th I think these are the sort of things you should have mentioned over breakfast, you were going to say. So I was emotionally steeled for it. Uh, great job. Uh, I think we're going to have some really good discussions, but if you can all hold questions. We're going to go through the presentations first. So uh, it, it's a real privilege and a pleasure to, to introduce uh, Dr. Jeremy Howick uh, from Oxford. And um, the first thing you're going to have to explain, Jeremy, is, is why you left Canada. Uh, you know, uh, people seem to think you shouldn't. Please, over to you. <laughs> I wonder the same thing myself sometimes, um, especially Vancouver. I'm from Montreal, which is the other, other great city in Canada. Um, so do you all know what this is? It's the Model T Ford. They f it was the very first production line car. They first started being produced in 1908. In 2008, 100 years after the first ones came off the production line, it was estimated that 50,000 were still roadworthy. How many of the technologies that we make now will still be useful in 100 years? Um, about the Model T Ford, Henry Ford said the following, I'll quote, I will bu build a car for the great multitude. It will be large enough for the family, but small enough for the individual to run and care for. It will be constructed of the best materials by the best people to be hired, by the most, the simplest designs that modern engineering can devise. But it will be so low in price that no one making a good salary will be unable to own one and enjoy with their family the blessing of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. My main argument is that the way we assess technologies in general, and evidence-based medicine specifically, needs a revolution, and that the things Henry Ford said can help guide that revolution. So there, there are three things I'd like to pick up on. One, he said, it's got to be with the simplest design made by the best people, it's got to be evidence-based. That's how I'm, I'm, I'm going to interpret that. Second, everyone can have, everyone can use one to enjoy. People need to want it. It has to be a real need from patients. Third, it's got to be affordable. And that's a tricky one given one of the other problems I'm going to discuss in a minute, the problem of too much medicine. So I'll go into each of these in some detail. Many of you know him, John Ioannidis. He's written a paper recently claiming that evidence-based medicine has been hijacked. And I think it's paradoxical because many of the problems that we have with evidence-based medicine have been identified by evidence-based medicine. John Brassi spoke about one of those. So the biggest problem, I think, is publication bias, which you just heard about. The other one is what I call hidden biases that sneak into treatments, to, to, to trials and reports of trials that can't be detected. They can't be detected because when we use the traditional evidence-based medicine methodology, they don't pick them up. How is it possible, for example, this is one example, for olanzapine to beat risperidone, for risperidone to beat quetiapine, and for quetiapine to beat olanzapine. That's just what happened in a series of trials. Logic can't explain it. So what does explain it? Who sponsored the trial? <laughs> Even the logo of the Cochrane collaboration, the forest plot for prenatal steroids, has been shown to be partially wrong due to partial reporting. And to be clear, I'm not against industry. Quite the contrary. Entrepreneurship is required for translation, for development, etc. But to quote John Ioannidis, if they are forced to assess their own products, 
I can't blame them if they buy the best advertisement, i.e. evidence, for their products. So the other problem with evidence-based medicine is that it has, albeit inadvertently, promoted too much medicine. Medical error is the third leading cause of death in the U.S. Life expectancy for almost the first time since World War II is going down in the U.S. It's flatlining elsewhere. The U.S. military has contacted me. They're worried that medical health care spending is becoming a threat to national security. They're worrying it might bite into the military budget. That might be a good thing, depending if you're a pacifist or not. Um, so again, I'm not against, no one here is against modern medicine. It's wonderful. But just like one glass of red wine is good, but 10 are bad, so we should use the right amount. <laughs> Chris is looking at me surprised. <laughs> It was, free, it was free last night, so he was uh, getting his fill. And in addition to uh, you know, addressing this from a policy, policy perspective, I'm trying to address it by educating patients about what counts as, as good evidence in a book that comes out in a few days. Um, the other problem with evidence-based medicine is that, or current evidence-based medicine, is an illegitimate focus on underlying mechanisms. Mechanisms are important for many things. But as I'll show with uh, one story from history, and then I'll show it's not just history, a focus on underlying mechanisms is not adequate to show things work. This is a picture of James Lind, who did a famous trial in 1747 comparing citrus fruits with a numerous other treatments to treat scurvy. Scurvy killed an estimated 2 million people between 1500 and 1800, devastated uh, navies. The other treatment, the main other treatment he compared citrus fruits with was elixir of vitriol. What was that? Sulfuric acid. That was the treatment recommended by the Royal College of Physicians of London based on their alleged mechanistic understanding. Scurvy, in their view, was a disease, disease of putrefaction. So of course, they needed something to perk the system up, which sulfuric acid supposedly did. Now, Lind found that the citric, citrus fruits did better than sulfuric acid, unsurprisingly, but he didn't promote it. Why not? He didn't understand the mechanism. Now, this is a story from history, but it's not just history. I've done a lot of research on mechanisms, and just a few decades ago, antiarrhythmic drugs were widely prescribed for people with arrhythmias based on alleged mechanistic understanding. They, they're estimated to have killed more people each year than Americans who died in the Vietnam War. Even more recently, my colleagues in London did a study. They found that most, the majority, 65% of cancer drugs are approved based on trials with surrogate outcomes. Now, surrogate outcomes, the claim from the surrogate outcome to the clinical outcome is parasitic on alleged understanding of mechanisms. A lot of medical devices are currently approved based on alleged mechanistic understanding. There are many problems with mechanistic reasoning. The main one is that they're oversimplifications. This here is a picture that you might see in nature. You might, if you're not familiar with metabolo me metabolic mechanisms, you might not understand it, but it's relatively simple. That's a mechanism for just one disease, and it's not complete. What it means is that any inference from alleged understanding of mechanisms to the claim that something works is likely to be spurious. Not only are these mechanisms complex, they're interrelated, interconnected, there are compensatory mechanisms, etc. So basically, we need to have unbiased, randomized trials conducted by independent bodies to show things work. I'm going to take that as given. And currently, evidence-based medicine doesn't do that. Now, something that's been implied in what I've said, which is, again, a bit disruptive, is that the current methods of evidence-based medicine are inadequate for dealing with these, these problems. Rules and regulations, more checklists and so on, will not solve the problems with hidden bias. They cannot solve the problem with someone who decides not to publish their trial. Several years ago, I was at a grade meeting and I suggested, why don't you downgrade the evidence if, the, if there's a known observable conflict of interest? There's a wide body of evidence that these conflicts of interest influence the results. They said, no, we're going to focus on things we can see. Again, the tip of the iceberg, as, as John said. It's fair to say from what we know now that their refusal to adopt this suggestion was probably a mistake. 
The only way to solve these very big problems is to start thinking in a very new way. I'm going to outline what I think that new way has to be by going back to the other two things that Henry Ford said. The second thing was people need, people have to need it. It has to be a real need, right? How do you know what patients need? It's not that hard. Talk to them or look at the, um, oh, there's the one, talk to them. One example where things happen that don't have a need are the inappropriate use of placebo-controlled trials. They still do placebo-controlled trials of new treatments and technologies in cases where we already have an established treatment. Patients don't want to know whether the new treatment outperforms a placebo. They want to know whether it outperforms what else they could have used. Yet these kinds of trials, in spite of efforts, do not, do not always get done. Other thing you can do is look at the WHO main causes of disease. Take a look at that for a moment, the top few. You've got heart disease, stroke, diabetes are all up there. Many of these are preventable, and I'm glad that someone raised the question of prevention earlier. Yet what proportion of national health care spending is spent on prevention? Does anyone know the answer? 3%. Three percent gets spent on, on prevention. So I'm not saying prevention is better than cure, but three percent doesn't seem like a reasonable amount. Um, one thing that I'm doing to try to address this is the opioid crisis, which was mentioned by the Honorable uh, Adrian in Dix. Um, we've seen with our preliminary evidence that the way doctors and patients communicate can help ward off eventual opioid use. Um, one trial, for example, where pa preoperative patients were randomized to receive education about their endorphins and pain, um, reduced their, the rate at which they fulfilled their opioid prescriptions after surgery, whereas none of the patients who were not educated about pain and endorphins did not uh, fulfill. So all the ones who weren't educated filled their prescriptions. The last thing is the most tricky. Ford said it had to be affordable. Given that the big problems we're having today are the problems of too much medicine, how do we address this issue of affordability on a wide scale? Because what it means is there's a paradox. You've got to make money somehow by getting people to use less medicine. How do you make money by telling people to buy less stuff? It's hard, but it's not impossible. And the best HTA minds in the world are here. You can figure it out, <laughs> I hope. Um, basically, I'm not saying you can figure it out. If I can think of some ideas, certainly you can think of better ones. Here are just two examples of things that can be done. First of all, there's um, social impact bonds. These are systems set up, um, I think the first one was in the UK in 2007, where an investor will invest money for a new technology that's supposed to save money and reduce uh, healthcare costs in any way whether it's prevention or treatment. And then if those savings are realized, the investor gets reimbursed. Another one is, here's the park run. Who's done the park run? There's one in Vancouver. Yes, wonderful. So the park run, you show up, you get a free time for your 5K run. No matter how fast you are, it's fun. They have the people hobbling on, along at the end compared to some very fast people at the front. And I usually start at the front and end up somewhere in the middle. Um, so these people make money. Exercise is a wonderful preventative medicine. It also encourages people to socialize. Both of these things have known benefits for health. They make money by sponsorship and selling paraphernalia. Now I'm going to read you a quote from a corporate well-being program, because I think this is where the real uh, direction needs to be in investing in well-being, which is preventative medicine. Here's a quote from one corporate well-being program, and your homework is, without Googling it, to guess which company it is. They said, um, oh, here it is. Our services, tools, and courses, exercise, mindfulness, etc., help employees take better care of themselves. This means we can give more to each other, our families, and our business. What company is it from? GSK. So paradoxically, GSK heavily invests in well-being programs 
so that their employees don't have to use drugs. <laughs> See the irony in that? Um, so the insurance companies provide another model in principle. It doesn't work in practice, but in principle, a great model because they're incentivized to make us use less medicine. There are reasons why I think they don't do that, but there are many are starting to do that. So Vitality Health in the UK, they incentivize people to do their 10,000 steps and so on. Apparently their, um, their carrot, though, is a caramel latte at Starbucks, which I'm not sure is, <laughs> is good for you. So to sum up, the current methods of evidence-based medicine don't suffice to address the big picture issues. What we need is affordable, basically medical Model T technologies that will last for decades to come. And I look forward to the ones you will develop. I look forward to using them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, uh, it's me now. Sorry about that. Um, just wait for my slides to come up. Uh, it, it, it's been great hearing about all the uh, the role of prevention and how we need to think more about it. And a, a lot of people, uh, myself included, I think, would kind of like a world in which HTA agencies kind of weren't necessary because we'd kind of figured everything out with public health and prevention interventions. But I think we need to accept that uh, there are industries global industries who will always be quite rightly bringing new technologies to the market and patients and, and clinicians and populations will, will ask governments to make a decision about them. So the, the, the need for our services is not going to go away and so we need to figure out how to do it well. Uh, we certainly need to be efficient in doing it. Um, so. Um, Title of my talk, Uncertainty in Healthcare Coverage Decisions, Does It Matter? Uh, so, uh, this is um, a, a very famous Nobel Prize winning physicist who, who, who made this comment. So, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. So, Niels Bohr. Decisions are basically about prediction. So we are engaged in an inherently difficult activity. Um, anyone recognize who this is? This is Carl. Partly I'm doing this so that Carl can say he was put up in the same space as Niels. I'll make him feel good. And partly because I've always wanted to do this. This is a quote from Carl's seminal paper. The irrelevance of influence. And he says, decisions should be based only on the mean net benefits, irrespective of whether differences are statistically significant or fall outside of a Bayesian range of equivalence. So Carl kicked off in 1999 saying, you know, uncertainty doesn't matter. So that makes for a very, very short presentation. And that's the other thing I've really always wanted to do. <laughs> it's every now and again to be able to say, no, Carl, you're wrong. Uh, and usually when I say, Carl, you're wrong, he then sort of gives me an intellectual kicking in public, and I say, okay, you were right. Uh, uh, but this time, I, I have a story to tell. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking and, and saying that, you know, it's all about opportunity cost and it's all about the risk of making the wrong decision and it's all about the value of information. And, and people look at me and then they glaze over and, and then they go to the bar or the coffee shop and, and basically try and avoid me. Uh, so I spent, how, how can I make these ideas real? How can I get over to people uh, that these are not just abstract economic thoughts that I sort of tweet about and write about as a way of avoiding having a proper job. Um, so now I have a story. It's taken a long time, but we, we, I have a story. Decision uncertainty is real, and, and that's what I want to do. I want to make decision uncertainty real to you with a, a, an example that uh, I think many people will recognize. 
So this is a classic trial, uh, the HERA trial of trastuzumab in early breast cancer. So trastuzumab is Herceptin. Uh, and it was a game-changing trial. Uh, the, uh, the cancers of the UK came back from ASCO uh, in 2005, uh, saying breast cancer is cured. He literally went into the Ministry of Health and said they've cured breast cancer. So everybody sat up. And everybody with budgets in the healthcare system went, Ouch, how much is this going to cost? So the HGA agencies around the world got, a, got out their systematic reviews and their decision analytic models and did their evidence synthesis. And just as we were kind of getting our head around what we thought was going on, um, this trial got published. Now, this trial's for, again, to choosing map. And it... Uh, it's called the FinHer trial, and it reported results saying that nine weeks rather than 12 months of Herceptin therapy was equally effective. So that led to a real question for the payers. Do we fund 12 months or do we fund nine weeks? Now, the HERA trial was 1,000 patients. FinHer trial only had like 230-something patients in its uh, early versus late, uh, short versus long trastuzumab in my bar. So whilst the central estimates were very similar, confidence interval in FinHer was much wider. We had this uncertainty. Could we, therefore, say, we can do with nine weeks. Uh, most countries in the world said, no, it's a bit too risky. So they went with the HERA dosage, 12 months. So I was in the UK at the time, and uh, I'd just left NICE. So I was, uh, I was involved in an appeal, arguing that they should uh, consider the FinHer dose. Anyway. Uh, as almost all of my experience working with NICE was, uh, they ignored me. <laughs> and here's their, there's, here's their decision. So, trastuzumab, given at three weekly intervals for one year or until disease recurrence occurs, is recommended as the treatment option for women with early stage HER2 positive breast cancer. So, the uncertainty drove them to go for the uh, 12 month therapy. At the same time, some very brave oncologists, breast cancer uh, docs in the UK, uh, launched a trial called the Persephone trial. And it's complete serendipity, but the Persephone trial is uh, going to be reporting, presented at ASCO tomorrow. And it basically did 12 months versus six months, but it's essentially the Fin her dose, but over six months on three weekly treatment, versus the HERA. So, um, I don't, some of you may have seen the Wall Street Journal article about it. Anyway, so here's the trial, and here's the abstract. Uh, I won't ask you to read that, I'll bring up the conclusion. Persephone has demonstrated that six months of trastuzumab is non-inferior to 12 months. Given the cardiac and other toxicities during months 7 to 12 of treatment, our result would support a reduction of standard trastuzumab duration to six months. So it's as effective, and it has basically half the side effect, half the toxic toxicity. So we had a decision uncertainty back in 2006, and we went a certain way. We went pro-access, less sensitivity to cost. So how much did it cost us? How much did the UK spend that they could have avoided spending? OK, let's find out. So the wrong decision has a cost. 
So this is a, a slightly dressed up back of the envelope. In 2006, the UK cost of Herceptin was £24,420. We dream of cancer drug costs like that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? <laughs> cancer Research UK tells me that there's about 55,000 diagnoses of breast cancer, early breast cancer in the UK each year. And a paper from Cronin et al. reports that 15% are HER2 positive. So the FinHer dose and the Persephone dose, essentially about 50% of the HER dose. So the saving per person is £12,200. And if we have 8,250 cases per year in the UK, how much money did we spend? Okay. So pretty much 100 million a year. So between 2006 and 2018, we spent 1.2 billion pounds that we could have had for other things. The way we processed our decision uncertainty has had a very significant cost for the UK NHS. So I hope you can see that the cost of making the wrong decision is real. Uh, and we should think about it. So let's think about uncertainty augmented decision making. What do we need to think about? So I would say, if I can, uh, anyway, the pointer doesn't get that far. We're really interested as decision makers in, 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 in trading off two things. There's, there's what happens to the patients in the trial and what happens to the patients outside the trial. So if you're going to favor early access, you're going to go and, and use uh, and only with research. So the research has to go on, but the vast majority of people get the technology. And that's what we've done in the UK with Herceptin. Um, if you're more, so that's sort of pro-early adoption, rapid access, and, and, and that's a lot of the conversation we have at the moment in HGA. How are we enabling rapid access? Access with maximum uncertainty. The alternative is to say, you know what, we're going to run a trial. And we're going to give access only in research, and the people outside of the trial will get standard therapy until the trial reports. And those two things, I want to argue, choosing between those is an empirical question. OK, so, um, sorry, John, this is the value of information moment. Okay. So uh, a very bright uh, breast cancer oncologist called Peter Hall published this paper back in 2011, demonstrating how you could work out the relative value of only in research versus only with research. So you probably can't see the details of this, but the, the solid line is only with research, and it's the value of that strategy. And the dotted line, sorry, solid line is only in research, and the dotted line is only with research. Uh, and down along the horizontal axis, we've got our value of health our willingness to pay for health, our cost-effectiveness threshold, whatever you want to talk, call it. Uh, and these are the population figures. So we've got basically hundreds of millions going up the vertical axis. What we see is for the UK, th this is actually a, 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 a vast in, in triple negative breast cancer trial this is from. But the principle that I, I'm putting this up to demonstrate is that only with research harms population health until you get to remarkably high levels of our willingness to pay for health. So in this case, it's slightly under £80,000 per quality adjusted life year because before the value we attach to health means that it is appropriate, it is efficient, it is population health maximising to go with only with research. 
Carl Claxton tells us that the quality threshold is about 13,000. So that's around one sixth of what it would need to be for NICE's decision to have been the right decision when it thinks about the value of uncertainty. So that's why I say, let's get quantitative. We can identify whether we should do only in research or only with research. And if we really are going to grapple with uncertainty as these innovative, potentially very high value technologies, but highly uncertain technologies come to market, then we have to get quantitative. We have to put the cost of making the wrong decision in front of the decision makers so they understand. Because if the UK spent 1.2 billion, God only knows what the US spent. Their prices are higher, their population is bigger. It wouldn't surprise me if they were close to 2 billion a year. That's a lot of other people's healthcare because we adopted a almost risk-seeking attitude to reimbursing new technologies. And that's not sustainable. So my challenge is to think about uncertainty as something that has a value that decision makers need to take account of. Thank you very much. And I'd now like to introduce uh, Professor Rachel Sachs. Thank you. So I'm a little afraid of the answer to this question that I want to ask before I get started. Are there any other lawyers in this room? <gasps> One, all the way in the back. All right, very you excited. Do you need him gone? No, it means that I will not have to stand alone against your slanderous attacks okay, on the legal right. profession. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little concerned that your, your, uh, your introduction to the legal profession might not be quite what I'm going to present today. I'm not sure I'm the most uh, representative example. Oh, I'm sorry, is there, do you have the clicker? Sorry, Perfect, sorry. thank you. you trying to handicap my presentation. So I am a law professor, but I do spend a lot of time working with economists and physicians, and HTA issues are very much a part of the legal work that I do. But because I am a law professor, I do begin with uh, disclosures. Uh, I do serve on the Midwest CPAC for ICER, which many of you may be familiar with their work. So here is the central question I want to address today. How does law think about, how does law deal with different types of evidence, different standards for evidence, and what can HTA learn from the law? I should say that there is plenty that law can learn from HTA, but that's a topic perhaps for my research and perhaps for the Q&A. So in law, there's two primary contexts within which uncertainty of the type that we're concerned with in HTA arises. First is rulemaking or the process of regulation, and then second is the process of adjudication. And law has chosen to deal with these issues in a primarily procedural way. So there's a sense in which the law just assumes that the answer coming out of the process is the right one, with a lot of scare quotes throughout many parts of this presentation. This concept of truth in the law is process-oriented. We trust in the process in a particular kind of way. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. All right. First, let's consider rulemaking, right? This is essentially when an administrative agency wants to promulgate a new regulation, a new rule. For instance, the government wants to know if it should require new cars to be built with seat belts, and if so, what kind of seat belts. There was a very contentious regulation involving a comparison between lap belts versus lap and shoulder belts versus airbags. Here we have a teddy bear modeling the appropriate use of a lap and shoulder belt. At the same time, we might have an agency deciding whether it wants to impose new pollution control measures on companies with particular types of emissions, and it's trying to measure the impact of on public health as one of many factors it's considering. And the key here is the process 
by which rulemaking occurs. So in the US, we refer to the way in which we conduct this process as notice and comment to rulemaking. Essentially, the agency gathers information about the problem they're hoping to solve. They put forth a proposed rule. And then they gather public comment on that proposed rule. And when the final rule is issued, the agency must respond publicly to the substance of these comments, must explain why it did or did not amend the proposal to consider any issues the commentators raised. The other primary context in which the law deals with uncertainty is adjudication. Right? When you have a dispute in court between two parties, this can be criminal, it can be civil. And here again, the law uses process to mediate the kinds of information that it will consider and the kinds of information that it deems relevant to any particular case. In some ways, you might say that the law puts a thumb on the scale of one party or another, depending on the procedural issue involved. So we have rules of evidence. Sometimes evidence will be excluded if it's deemed unduly prejudicial to one party. There are specific rules around expert testimony, who's entitled to give it, about what issues are they permitted to speak, etc. We also have burdens of proof. Depending on the type of case, one party may need to meet a higher or lower standard of proof for their claims. Maybe they need to prove their case based on only a preponderance of the evidence, or maybe they need to do more. Maybe they need to prove their case uh, by clear and convincing evidence or even beyond a reasonable doubt. And the other thing to note about adjudication is that in many countries, including Canada, including the United States, the system is adversarial, meaning that the parties to the case, the ones before the judge, are the ones controlling the introduction of evidence. The judge is limited in terms of the ability, uh, their ability to consider information outside the record and to order its production and introduction. If the parties haven't presented it, it's difficult and in some cases irresponsible or inappropriate for the judge to rely on that information. This is not the only option. Of course, the French system is much more inquisitorial. The judge has more control over the development of evidence in their cases. And there are different reasons why you might adopt one system or the other. All right, so once the initial decision is made, that's, of course, not always the end of the discussion. There are opportunities for error correction, not only throughout the making of the individual decision, but even after that decision is made. So as I mentioned, you know, during the rulemaking process, we can amend the proposed rule before the final rule is issued. In the middle of a trial, a judge can change their mind about how they're going to instruct the jury or introduce different pieces of evidence. But even once that decision is made, then we enter a different phase of the process. And what I mean here uh, when I say that the initial decision might be wrong or that we're correcting an error is true in a couple of different senses, only one of which might be relevant to HTA. So in the adjudication context, it's sort of easy to see that you would say we were wrong if we convicted somebody of a crime who turned out not to have committed the crime. But usually what we're talking about is something like in the rulemaking context, the agency is making a judgment that the benefit of requiring this particular form of seatbelts outweighs the costs. And it turns out we were wrong about forecasting consumer demand and how it might play out in the long run, right? So you could imagine that requiring a particular new safety measure might drive up the cost of new cars so much that consumers will hang on to their older unsafe cars for longer than the agency anticipated. And there's even more accidents as a result, right? You could imagine the forecasting errors. And these are much more similar, I think, to the kinds of questions that HTA deals with on a regular basis. So in the rulemaking context, if you think the agency was wrong in this sense to issue a particular regulation, you can challenge that regulation in court, at least often. But in the US, if the agency followed this procedure, if they engaged in notice and comment rulemaking, and the issue was within the agency's jurisdiction or expertise to consider, as long as that decision was reasonable, a court will defer even if that court would have reached a different conclusion itself in the first instance when presented with the relevant information. 
In the context of adjudication, of course, we also have appeals if you don't like the initial decision, but it's sometimes very hard to win or even bring these appeals, and the justice system has established presumptions for different reasons. So if the state is prosecuting a criminal case and the jury votes to acquit a defendant, the prosecution can't always appeal that decision. So why am I telling you all this, of course? Uh, in my view, there's at least three ways in which these lessons can be applied to HTA, and I know we have limited time, so I'll just scratch the surface of a few of these issues. So first, stakeholder input. Legal processes are heavily dependent on input from a variety of stakeholders, often including the public at large. This input helps provide not only substantive support for the relevant policy outcome, but it also helps build legitimacy for the results. And in my work on the ICER CPAC, I've learned, I know that this is something many great HTA organizations already do, but it's important to continually reevaluate and reassess our commitment to it at different stages of the process. Second, building values into the process. Legal processes are structured to benefit particular parties in particular situations, reflecting our social values. And this is true both for better and for worse. Here's an example which I think exemplifies both sides of this increasingly. Um, in the US, we have a tight connection between regulatory approval of a new drug and insurer reimbursement for that new drug. Most, and in some cases all, new drugs will be reimbursed by our large public payers and we pay more. So we just heard about how much exactly might we have been spending on Herceptin over and above what might be clinically recommended. And the answer is probably, or almost certainly, it's a lot. Right? So at a time when the FDA was only approving drugs with really strong evidence of safety and efficacy up front, this made sense, right? We wanted to ensure that patients had access to these drugs that we knew worked. But now that agencies are approving drugs more quickly on the basis of less evidence, this process no longer obviously serves the goal we'd initially set out, right? providing access to drugs known to be safe and effective. And so that brings me to the third lesson. Establish corrective procedures. Make sure there are opportunities in the process to obtain conflicting views and to defend the decision subsequently as these often create a more robust process on the front end if you can anticipate legal action and respond to potential uh, lawsuits against you. So in keeping with this question about the relationship between regulation and reimbursement, Maybe we should reconsider either the changes to or our regulatory process or this link entirely because of the changes that have occurred on both sides of the issue. One option is to construct systems that permit access with evidence development or the use of real world evidence, and I know we're going to hear a lot about those later at this conference as we have in previous conferences. But there are other options. So one uh, legal development we might take inspiration from is adaptive regulation particularly in the context of environmental law, environmental regulation. A lot of scholars are considering whether regulations can be designed to adapt automatically to particular triggers in the environment, like temperature, sea level rise, animal habitats, to become more or less aggressive over time. It's not necessarily a process of re-review like coverage with evidence development, although it can be. It can also be a process of a pre-commitment device for an agency that anticipates a particular range of possible outcomes and wants to avoid making some of these political decisions in the future if it's able to do so and to forecast the possibilities. So I do think there are a lot of parallels between the ways in which legal processes address uncertainty and the challenges facing HTA. Um, I know that we have a lot to learn in law from HTA, and I'm hopeful uh, that HTA can also learn something from law about how to improve these systems. Thank you. Microphones uh, to be shared amongst our speakers. Uh, so I throw this open to the uh, to the floor. Uh, any questions for any of our speakers? Hi, uh, Lars Sandman, uh, Swedish ethicist uh, involved in reimbursement decision. 
Thank you for a very inspiring and, and interesting uh, panel session. I have a reflection and, and possibly a question for Rachel, I think. Um, I, am, I mean, we are trying to do what you, you encourage us to do when we sort of weigh together all the different evidence, types of evidence. And, and we write up recommendations that to some extent look like legal verdicts. And still we are accused of being non-transparent. And it seems like this uh, lack of transparency is, is about non-predictability. So people want almost quantitative measures that could be sort of decided on beforehand where the, where the decision should end. Uh, and I mean, you don't find the same kind of discussion within the legal sector, or maybe you do. Uh, and if you do, I mean, what you, should you do about this? Could you, could you sort of inform the stakeholders in a way to understand the, the process, etc.? cetera? Or, or any reflections on that? The microphone. Thank you very much. Yes. It, is this, it's on? We're good? All right. So thank you so much for the question. Unfortunately, I do have to report that even when processes are nominally or even quite seriously open to the public, there often are ways in which they can be attacked or criticized as not appropriately accounting for public opinion in many different ways. In some sense, that's because there are so many different stakeholders. It's, it's not possible to bring them all into the process at different times. In other ways, it might be simply an attack on the outcome that was obtained as being not what that interest group may have wanted. So the key here, and, and I have seen this uh, with my work with ICER, is that there's a process of genuine engagement from the beginning, making sure people know what's going on and when, that really does build support among the relevant constituencies. There will always be criticism, and many of that criticism may take the form of non-transparency, but if you have neutral adjudicators like judges, like other sort of governmental panels, making sure that this process has been conducted appropriately from the beginning. In some ways, it's hard to imagine a system that's, that's better than that from a procedural perspective. Please, um, uh, I'll alternate between the microphones. <laughs> hi, Jonathan Michaels, um, Sheffield. We, in decision analysis and in um, economic modeling, we put an awful lot of effort into characterizing and modeling uncertainty. But it seems to me that the real issue is not uncertainty, but bias. And we, there's a lot of evidence out there about bias. About, and we very rarely actually see that being modeled. Do you think there are ways that we could be much more encompassing in looking at how bias might affect the results of our modeling? So if you had been at our workshop yesterday morning, you would have seen uh, Alison Smith from, Chef, uh, from Leeds uh, present some really fascinating work on incorporating uh, measurement uncertainty and bias in measurement uncertainty in precision medicine evaluations. And, and uh, I think keep an eye on that space. There's, uh, between Alison and Dr. Beth Shimkins, there's some really interesting stuff going on there. Please. Okay, I'm, I'm Zoe from NICE. I was on the appeal panel for Septim with you. I think that one of the problems we had with Septim was actually around the uh, licensed indication and the actual dosing. And for many HD agencies and reimbursement agencies... Could you get a little closer to the, the microphone? Um, the dose that we're actually asked to make recommendations on is sometimes um, it's defined for us by the regulators. So what role do you think the actual regulators also play in helping to define the most appropriate doses that should then be taken forward for reimbursement and HTA? I, I think that's a, a very interesting question. Um, it is within the scope of national authorities to choose whether or not they make HTA decisions only on the licensed uh, dosage. Uh, NICE. Uh, for perfectly understandable reasons, chooses to constrain itself that way. Um, but what I think is very interesting is, is the UK has been a leader in developing these trials that, uh, that address the dosing issue or the uh, equivalent, bioequivalent uh, technology. So if you think about Avastin versus Lucentis trial in uh, AMD, 
the Persephone trial for breast cancer, uh, there's a, a, a sinitinib in renal cal cell carcinoma trial, which are all uh, looking at non-licensed doses. So it, it's a decision of NICE uh, to do that. Uh, it's not a legal requirement, as I understand it, but it is a decision. It's, it's completely understandable to do that. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Livia. I'm talking um, on behalf of my group in Brazil. And I would like to know from the panelists, evermore uh, drugs are being licensed and uh, financed with scarce and biased evidence. So why don't we change the paradigm and uh, start doing more performance assessment, reward performance assessments to guide and um, our decisions uh, in terms of what we do when more people are using it, how to control that, because it's we have a lot of uncertainty to put it on the market and to give it to our patients, and we have to change it along the way, and most times we are not doing that everywhere. It's not done. Okay, I'll make one comment and then hand over. Uh, I, I, I think companies do exactly what society asks them to do. And I, I, I'm, I'm leery of throwing around critiques of bias and such like that. They, they, they do what they are asked to do and, and, and serve an important role in, in the ecosystem. The fact that we then have the option of using real world evidence to evaluate things in practice to, to, to improve the evidence base, that's not a, uh, a statement that we think what we've got is necessarily biased. It's just not necessarily sufficiently certain for us not to need to do that. So, members of the panel, any further comments about real-world evidence and such like? I mean, I think I mentioned that John Ivanidis said that if we ask them to evaluate their own products, can't blame them for buying the best advertisement and the evidence. So I think unbiased assessments uh, from independent bodies are the, are the answer, and they are done sometimes. And the other thing is that, that you picked up on is the, the patients take all the risk. If it turns out not to be, if it didn't work in the real world, the patients take all the risk. So that's an anomaly in society. You're talking about what they do, what society asks them to do. From Nebuchadnezzar to Victorian England, whoever built a bridge, in, in Victorian England, if you built a bridge, you just sleep under it for a few days. That was the risk assessment. Now instead of doing that, they hire risk assessors who never know as much about the risks as the person who built it. So the people who are approving the drugs, do it in a biased way, it's a reality, and we, we don't require that they're, they're independent to the assessments, and that's, that's our fault, partly. And we also should find ways to, for those who um, cause the harm, to, to share the risk. Right now, patients are taking all the risk in the public purse. But I think also too often we've given the regulators a more limited set of tools than they need to make the right kinds of decisions. So why is it that, as we just said, the FDA or the EMA or other agencies are considering a particular dose? Maybe that is what the industry has presented to them, but maybe if we asked the payers for their input up front, right? maybe if we had uh, these payers say, well, here's what we think it might be used for, even if it's being studied for this particular indication, maybe we should think about design and clinical trials up front so that we're gathering the right information, so that we're making public, public health oriented decisions, that we're making financially responsible decisions, and involving those kinds of entities early on in the process, I think does have some benefits for exactly the reasons you suggested. Can I just follow up with that? I think that's, that's absolutely right, Rachel, and the regulation giving them the powers they need will help things. However, I think that there's a sense in which um, there'll always be something that regulators miss. So aligning interests kind of solves the problem. So like, like the, the guy who builds the bridge or the person who builds the bridge has to sleep under it. Um, so aligning the interests of profitability with the interests of patients will make regulation much easier. But regulation, of course, as you mentioned, is absolutely a part of the solution. Great question. When the panel starts Thank discussing you. with each other, you know you've got a good question. Catherine. Someone make a spike, please. Thank you. Um, Catherine Meads, Professor of Health at Anglia Ruskin in Cambridge. Uh, I've been a senior systematic reviewer for a long while. I will, this really is a question to John, but also relevant to others as well. It's around the issue of iceberg and um, making evidence more rapidly available. There's a group of ecologists and conservation scientists 
who have taken all of the relevant evidence around conservation, a huge body of evidence, they've codified it into one very large database around uh, applicability, geographical coverage, quality of the evidence, effect size, and made a very useful um, user-friendly interface so people can interrogate that database and find out the best evidence for their local area about which interventions would work in conservation science. It means that what you have is instantly available evidence. It's taken them two years to do it. If you did something like that in medicine, it would take huge resources, first of all, to set it up and to agree the quality assessment, the effect sizes, and all the other things like that. But it would mean that after it's set up, you would be able to have more or less instant ideas about the evidence on a particular intervention, rather than having to do a systematic review. Now, at the moment, we're doing multiple systematic reviews all over the world for all sorts of things. Now, if we could set up something like this, it would make what we were doing at the moment more like a cottage industry. And I'm just wondering whether this is something, say, um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation might assist with. Yeah? I second that. Uh, but no, I, 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 it's, it's, a law, it's a great idea. But I think the problem is the organization of it. The, particularly the pharmaceutical companies don't like to play ball. Uh, Tom Jefferson, who I mentioned, he had to go through an awful lot of hoops uh, to get half the uh, clinical study reports he got. Because there was a, the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, have just, uh, they've been debating for years how they can release the clinical study reports. And one option that pharmaceutical companies wanted was the person had to go to Brussels to sit in the room and not take any notes and just sit in a terminal so they could read it. Literally, that's what they wanted because they don't want to share the data because the data is potentially inconvenient. And so I think it's a great idea. And I th there, are, there are certainly efforts out there about freeing up the data. Ben Goldacre is doing some great work in that, highlighting missing trials. Uh, but I, you know, I, yeah, get some funding for it and we can, have a, we can, we can make a start. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Easy. I'll do that. I, 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 going to have to stop there. We've uh, got literally into the last minute. Thank you to our panellists, if you can uh, express appreciation. And thank you all for making just a great start to uh, HCAI 2018. Have a great conference. Bye-bye.